In a previous video, we talked about the storage of energy by putting together a collection of charges and storing energy in the electric field. A device specifically set up to do this is called a capacitor. Capacitors were very important in early physics of the 1700s. In particular, there was a device developed at the University of Leiden called a Leiden jar, which was an early capacitor. And it was with the Leiden jar, not with lightning bolts, that Ben Franklin made most of his important discoveries about electricity. A capacitor is an electrical device that stores energy in an electric field. Uh, you can think of it as an electronic piggy bank. It's a storage device. Often we have energy, but we wish to release that energy at a particular time, and it's at a time that we don't necessarily collect energy. For instance, we may collect energy for quite a while and then want to dump all that energy out in a very short period of time to get a flywheel to go, for instance, in a ceiling fan or in your car. These are called starting capacitors. So we store energy for a long time and then we release it in a very short time so we can get a lot more power. Well, a capacitor is very useful for this sort of stuff. In the capacitor, you'll have two plates. They can be of a wide variety of geometries, although I've shown them parallel plates here. And on one side you will put positive charge, and you'll get that positive charge by moving it from the other plate, which will leave behind negative charge. The separation of charge will create an electric field. And that electric field will necessarily create a potential difference between one plate and the other, which we'll call V. Now, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to determine how much charge is on the plates for a given electric field or voltage, or if we put the charge on the plates, we'd like to be able to calculate V and E. Now, we discussed some of that, again, in that previous video, that as you moved charges in and you, to a situation and you started putting them down, you would change the voltage on the configuration, and you would likewise put energy into the system. For a capacitor, as we put charge in to its plates, we find that it has a very specific voltage, and the relationship is that the charge is equal to the voltage times some constant called the capacitance. So this is the capacitance. This is the voltage between the plates. And this is the charge on one plate. And we're not caring about the sign because we know if one plate is positive, the other plate will be negative. So this is the charge on a plate. Now let me graph what this looks like. What I'm saying is that as you move charge between the plates, Q, and you would find the voltage between the plates would go up, and it will go up linearly. And the slope of this is 1 over this quantity we call C. Now you may think, well, why didn't we make the slope equal instead of making it 1 over C? I'll show you in a minute why C is related to something very familiar to us, which we're going to call as capacity. All right? So you could plot it this way. You could have plotted the charge on the plates and the voltage and then the slope would be C. But its reality is, is that we start putting the charge on the plates. And by putting the charge on the plates, they create the voltage. It's not that we start generally increasing the voltage to the plates and watching the charge that the plates could put, that the plates acquire. So it's usually this is the independent variable, the charge we put on the plates and they cause the voltage between the plates to be created. So this is really the way the graph would be. And one over that 
number, the capacitance, would give you this slope. So there's a linear relation between voltage and charge. You need to memorize this formula. This formula is incredibly important. It is the key formula for capacitors. All right. It is, we'll find out the resistors have their formula called Ohm's Law. Capacitors have this formula. You need to know this formula. Now, when thinking about capacitance, I want you to remember the phrase charge capacity. We think about capacitance capacity like the capacity of a water tank to hold water. The more water you can hold, the bigger the capacity of the tank. A capacitor, the bigger the capacitance, the more charge it can hold for a given voltage. So it is the same thing like filling up a tank. Bigger capacitance, more charge holding capability. So I want you to think of that. I think that's extremely useful in being able to deal with this. Charge capacity is what capacitance means. Now the units of capacitance come straight from our work. They are a coulomb in our definition divided by a volt. This is just me rearranging the equation. C is then going to be Q over V. Now we've given that a name. It's called a farad after Dr. Michael Faraday. And usually, that's either given a big F for Faraday, which is, would make sense, but some books will also put a little F. All right? So it is a coulomb, which was the name of a person, and volt was the name of a person, and a coulomb over a volt is another name of a person, which we call the Farad, which is short for Faraday. Now, the capacitance, the ability to hold charge, is dependent on two things. One is geometry of the capacitor and the other is the material placed between the conductors. Now a water analogy is very useful in this section. So let me show you how we use the water analogy. In the water analogy voltage, which is related to electrical potential, is connected to gravitational potential which depends on height. Charge, which is what we're talking about, capacity, is related to amount of water. So in this thing, let's look at the following. We have the same height. This is a same voltage analogy. This A2, the area of this tank, is greater than the area of tank 1, our water tank. And it is obvious if we look at this that you can put a whole lot more water in this bigger tank. But if you can put a whole lot more water for a given height, that's the same thing as saying you can put a lot more charge for the same voltage. And remember, Q is CV. So we made the V the same, but this one here, number two, says that Q2 is greater than Q1. Therefore, C2 is greater than C1. So a bigger area would should make the capacitance go up. And this is in fact exactly what we find out. So with the water analogy, we have that capacitance is proportional to area. Now our area isn't a cross-sectional area of our water tank, it's the area of the plates. Another place where we can use the water analogy. This time let's keep the Q the same and instead look at what happens to the voltage. So if we keep the Q the same, we're going to put the same amount of water in two different tanks. So again, here's a low A compared to that low C. 
in this tank for a given height has a lower capacity. So we're talking about a lower C and a higher C. So for a given capacitor, if you have a small capacitance, you'll end up with a higher voltage, just as this water tank, for a given amount of water, will have a greater height. And for the larger capacitor, for the same amount of charge, you'll have a lower voltage. Again, the water capacity type thing works out real well. So, same Q. larger voltage for smaller capacitor. The water analogy is a very useful practical thing when you're trying to get a handle on understanding capacitors. The second thing that can affect a capacitor's capacitance is how much charge you can hold is if you put a material that's an in, a non-conductor between the plates. In this case, I've got charge Q on one plate, and that charge Q was moved to this plate, leaving behind a minus Q on the other plate. So we have some plus charges, and we have some minus charges. And this creates a voltage difference between these two. So plus V, and we'll say that's our ground or zero reference point over there. If we put a dielectric material in there, that's an insulator, the electric field with the, from these positive charges will attract these negative charges toward the positive charges and repel the positive charge slightly in the other direction toward the negative charges. Now this creates a separation of charge. You have a negative and a positive and they create their own field in the opposite direction. So this is called an induced field. So the initial electric field causes the dielectric to be polarized. This produces an internal electric field by induction that opposes the initial electric field. Thus, the resultant electric field, when you add the two fields, one field going this way, and an induced field in the other way, that produces a smaller field. So this reduces to a smaller than the initial electric field. Since the total electric field is reduced, or is smaller, take your pig, the electrical potential to grow across the plates is also smaller, since this is E times D. Thus, more charge can be added to the capacitor to increase the electrical potential. And therefore, the capacitor's capacitance has increased. In general, a material is used by what's called a dielectric constant, and the C nu is equal to that K times C old. This is the dielectric constant, a number you get from a table. All right, that's it for capacitors for this video. I'll talk to you on another video.